I'm at 731 Bull Barks. Today we're here with Mr. Mark Puente from workofthegrainhardwoods.com. We're going to talk about the five mistakes to avoid when buying hardwood. Thanks, hey, man. Mark. Good. How about yourself? Good, man. It's been a little while. It has. It's good to Thank be back so here with you. He's down in 731 land now. This video is brought to you by 731woodworks.com. Go check out our online store. We have easy to follow build plans to help you make awesome projects. So Matt, when we talk about hardwoods, we have to talk about all woods, right? We're just talking about a specific hardwood. We think because it's hard, it's not gonna have the same characteristics as soft, but they do. And so some of those points that we need to consider is grain pattern matters. And when we take a look at some of our straight grains like this piece of walnut here, we think, well, it's nice, it's elongated. I'm not gonna have any troubles with it, but all wood moves. And so when we look at hardwoods, we wanna make sure that we take a look at that grain pattern and take into consideration where it might move. So some of those areas that we will see movement will be right here at a knot hole or the possibility of any other checked areas that we see here. When you say checked, what do you mean by checked? Checking is a natural process, Matt. When the wood begins to dry out, it'll crack. And all woods crack, they move. And so typically we'll see cracking happen at the end grain of a piece of wood. And so we'll see it right here. And that is because the end grain, which is here at the end, is drying out quicker than the rest of the wood in the face or the rest of the field. And so it'll crack in those areas. Take that into consideration when you buy hardwoods and make sure you get enough extra so you can combat that edge grain. And you were saying earlier that a lot of woods that are stored vertically, like on concrete, that's yes, you see that. because those that edge grain is like straws. They'll suck up any moisture that you have on the floor in your concrete area and moisture settles. It's in the air, but it eventually settles down and it'll find its way into your wood. So if you can put a buffer in between it, a piece of rubber mat will work fine or actually sometimes plywood you can set down there. And then we also talked about what type of uh, considerations with hardwoods and most of the time when we think of hardwoods, we think of kiln dried. And so yes, that does stabilize it and bring down the moisture content of a piece of wood to about seven to 9%. However, there is still moisture and you'll have some movement in there as it acclimates itself to this environment. Now, Matt, you're getting ready to do a great project here and you're gonna take this walnut and you're gonna make it into a tabletop. So you're going to do some gluing. You're also going to be doing some pinning, right? What is your process that you're going to use? Dominoes, most likely. Okay. So dominoes will help stabilize some of the movements on the edge grain. So when Matt glues the edges together, he's going to want to make sure he starts with a true area. If he uses this cracked area, it will crack. It will continue to crack and it'll find its way all the way to the end of the board. So you'll want to trim and work around that area. Also taking into consideration with your movement is air dried is perfectly fine. We started out years ago with air dried species of wood and we made furniture out of it. So what's the big to do about kiln dried? Well, kiln drying takes away some of the um, pitfalls that we have, such as bugs. And in here, this is called ambrosia beetle and it's from the fungus that comes through. And so by kiln drying this, it kills off any of those bugs in those areas that would be left behind. So you get a, a species of wood that should be somewhat fungus free. And then also in addition to it, stabilized with a lower percentage of moisture content. Is there now, bugs still in here? No, Dead ones? no, they're gone. Yep, they vacated their home, but they sure left behind a pretty pattern, didn't they? And that is really a choice piece of wood to find that. And this is, what kind is this? This is ambrosia and this is called uh, ironwood and it's native species of Arkansas. So that brings us to our next tip here, Matt. Embrace the imperfection of God's renewable resource. If you get a knot hole or these little holes here from a beetle or even a check mark from another piece of ambrosia maple that we have here at the end, Matt, you can see that. Looks like a pitchfork. Stabilize them. Use that piece of wood, don't throw it away. If you can put some epoxy into that area or actually put a filler in there that you want some type of opposing color, contrasting color, this wood is still usable. Don't throw it away. It'll bring a lot of character to your work mm -hmm. and make it more creative for you. So in some of the straight grains like this purple heart, 
you'll find cracking and that's going to happen because it's such an elongated grain that it dries out at a different rate. It's okay if it happens, you'll just have to make sure that you watch out for it and you'll see early indications that that's going to happen through the end grain itself here. So keep an eye on that end grain when you're picking it out. End grain tells the story. It really does. So when we go to a lumber yard in our hardwood distributor, sometimes you'll see markings at the end of the wood. They'll be colorized. And we have that here. Let's take a look, Matt. We can see that the color of this end grain is green, but we still have a check mark here. Sometimes lumber yards will mark it because of the species, but it's also to help with that checking. If you seal up that end grain, it's less likely to get moisture into those straws that are here at the end. One consideration when working with hardwoods is you want to make sure you take a look at the end grain patterns. These smiles and then frowns are important because they will move. And so to combat the overall movement of a glued up piece, whether it's a cutting board, tabletop, or it's just an art piece that you want to hang on the wall, is you want to make sure that you cup one direction, as this is a smile, the very next board next to it should be a frown. When gluing this together, it helps from the movement. And of course, if you were to glue on here, it would be the same hills and valleys, but you'll want to repeat. That'll help stabilize your wood. If I was to glue this board up, both frowning or both smiling, what would happen? It would cup downward. Like that? Correct. You would think that it would cup with the ends going up, but actually it wants to go against that. It'll come down. So I get a lot of questions about that. I get a, somebody will email me a picture of their tabletop that they glued up the night before. They come back the next day and it looks like, like that. It is, both sides are off the table that they left it on. So most of the time, Matt, that can contribute to either a high moisture in the air or that the wood did not have enough time to acclimate. Or when they clamped it up, they did not put calls on it to keep it flat. And that's just as important, making sure that you're registering off of a flat build space. Mm -hmm. That build space area, like the table that you have here, is uh, very key to making furniture and making sure that it's registering off a level area. So when somebody brings like this walnut into my shop now, how long would you suggest I let that sit in the shop and acclimate before I start cutting and milling? So if it was air dried, I'd say that it would need to set longer for it to acclimate to your space. But this is kiln dried product. And so probably 24 to 72 hours uh, time frame. Sometimes you'll get a rain pattern that'll happen in between those three days, uh, one to three days. And so you would want to set for a little bit longer. Buy yourself an inexpensive moisture meter. You can get them online through Amazon. That will always tell you what's going on. It won't always tell you what's happening in the core, but it'll tell you what's happening on the surface. I'll put a link in the description below to a moisture meter. And I've got a dehumidifier over there that it won't let it get over 45% humidity in here. Uh, if it goes below that, it doesn't run. So it may be 25%, but if it goes over that 45%, then it'll kick on and keep it at a regulated humidity in here. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Uh, also, an air conditioning in your space helps keep the moisture down. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a large garage door in your area, uh, and so it will exchange the air outside, which has a high humidity rate. Um, so oh, I, you'll... I don't open that unless it's, yeah. it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> so when you do that, you want to make sure that you just give your wood enough time to get acclimated to the space rest, if you will. Awesome. So Mark is with WorkingTheGrainHardwoods.com in Bentonville, Arkansas, and he does ship hardwoods uh, nationwide for lower 48. Yes. So if you're interested, uh, give him a shout or look on his website. They've got cutting board kits. They've got all kinds of species of hardwoods that you can choose from, exotics and domestics. And uh, this is where I buy my hardwoods, and I highly recommend. Excellent customer service and just an all-around nice guy. Give us a call. We're glad to help you. Thank, Thank you, Mark. you. You bet, Matt. If you found this content valuable, hit that subscribe button, click the bell icon next to it to get notified of all of our new content we've got coming. If you like this video, you're gonna love the video we did previously right there where we talked about buying hardwoods, what to expect, what to ask, what to look for. Click in that box to get you a big old virtual fist pump. Also another one of my favorite videos about buying wood from big box stores, right there.